Hello? Is the mic doing its thing? Y'all hearing me okay? I'm not screaming at you. Uh, I'm going to read the first part of this, and then I'm going to uh, go on and get out of here. My name is Brad Tyre. I'm the editor of Montana Free Press, uh, based in Helena. And um, thank you all for coming here. This has been a really exciting event for us so far, the first time we've done Free Press Fest. Uh, I need to thank the sponsors and the partners who helped make this all possible. Uh, that includes the UM School of Journalism, the RIN, uh, the Montana Community Foundation, the Baucus Institute, and the Mike and Maureen Mansfield Center, and uh, first and foremost, the University of Montana. Uh, you are here for breakout session number five. We're going to take a close look at the unique challenges that come with visitation and population growth in Montana. This is uh, a topic that well, I probably don't need to convince you is interesting because you're already here. We spend a lot of time thinking about it at Free Press. Um, look at the implications for Montana residents, wildlife, and natural resources um, in an environment where we are flooded with people who weren't here last year. Uh, I can say that because I wasn't here 15 years ago, so I've been here for a while. But uh, uh, an in-migrant uh, like many of us. Um, I am excited to introduce the moderator for this conversation. Uh, I'm not going to call you Joseph. Uh, Joe O'Connor, the managing editor for the nonprofit media group Mountain Journal. Uh, that's a conservation journalism organization covering the wildlife and the wildlands of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Uh, Joe previously served as editor in chief for Mountain Outlaw magazine and the Explore Big Sky newspaper in Big Sky, Montana. He moved to Montana in 2012 after taking graduate journalism courses at Harvard in Cambridge. Uh, I had to read that because I'm not super familiar with Joe's resume. Uh, how I am familiar with Joe is as a fellow editor uh, working in Montana. Editors don't get to work with each other very often, so you don't really get to see how other people do it. And most editors end up editors by accident. Uh, they're either failed or some weird degree of successful reporters. Um, but my experience with Joe is watching the work that he's produced uh, at Mountain Outlaw, at, uh, at Mojo, and the thing that I've noticed, even though I don't really know how he works, is how good a story he gets out of writers, oftentimes writers that I've had an opportunity to work with as well. So we don't get our bylines on stories, but uh, as a behind the scenes editor, I'm aware of Joe's work, primarily by saying, God, how did he get that? How did he make that work? So I'm an admirer and a fan. He's going to have the pleasure of introducing a, uh, an amazing lineup of panelists here for this conversation. Talk into the mic, not away from the mic. So that's what I've got. Thank you all for being here. Joe O'Connor. Uh, thank you very much, Brad, uh, for the kind words. Um, you know, I, I actually could return the favor. I've watched you pull some stories together that I, I was pretty blown away by and uh, have always had a great respect for your work and, and the work at Montana Free Press. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, and thank you all, you know, for coming uh, today. It's, it's hot out there. It's kind of hot in here. Uh, the other two rooms, I thought I had it outsmarted by bringing a jacket, and I was beaten by this room. Uh, so welcome to the UC Ballroom uh, for this panel discussion uh, as part of Free Press Fest, which um, I've had to say a lot over the past couple weeks, and it's, it's really difficult. If, you, if you're saying it a lot, Free Press Fest three times, it's not going to happen. Um, and a heartfelt thank you to the University of Montana for hosting this event. Uh, and to John Adams, Brad Tyre, uh, Rachel Gregg, and the whole team at Montana Free Press uh, for putting this together. Um, it's an incredible lineup, uh, as you all are witnessing last night and today, uh, of speakers, panels, workshops, and discussions. Um, as Brad mentioned, I'm Joe O'Connor, Managing Editor for Mountain Journal. Uh, since 2017, Mojo has been uh, the foremost nonprofit journalism organization covering the wildlife and wildlands uh, and their intersection with human culture in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. The GYE is comprised of more than 22 million acres, uh, and it's renowned as one of the largest nearly intact temperate ecosystems in the world. Also, don't say that three times fast. That's not going to happen either. Um, 
Much of our coverage at Mojo is in uh, Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Parks. Much of it is in Idaho and Wyoming. Uh, and a great deal is here in the state of Montana. For years, uh, visitation to the treasure state uh, has been on the rise, but it exploded uh, when COVID-19 hit the scene. Office buildings across the country shuttered their doors and we were encouraged to work from home. People then realized that remote work allowed your office to be anywhere. We, couldn't, we also couldn't fly and many people took to the old family station wagon from across the country uh, and began coming to places where the government encouraged us to be, away from crowds, socially distanced, uh, and outside in nature. Many flocked to the wide open spaces in the American West, and in particular, the Northern Rockies. They came to the national parks, Yellowstone, Grand Teton, Glacier, and we all witnessed the parade of folks coming to Montana. So we could, we could probably discuss the topic of loving Montana to death for about a week. Uh, but we're going to cram it in to about 90 minutes, uh, give or take. Um, but this is an important conversation uh, with many perspectives, and we do want to hear yours. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions of your own, but to hold them, uh, please hold them until the end when we have an audience Q&A session. So much of what we discuss today comes down to the concept of values. And I've been thinking about this, you know, for a few weeks now, and I think a lot of it does really come down to that. Uh, we can discuss common values that all people share, the need for uh, healthy food, shelter, safety, a good education for our kids. We can all agree on these things. In the context of this conversation, see you Brad, thanks. I want us all to be thinking about the values we share in the West. A love for wildlife, for community, for elbow room, for tradition. Can the shared values in Montana be shared? To what degree and to what expense? I'm honored to be here uh, and part of this discussion and to share the stage with these three incredible women who will be bringing a really well-rounded perspective to our conversation. Racine Freedy has worked in the tourism industry for 30 years, 18 of those with Western Montana's Glacier Country, where she is currently the president and CEO. She has worked at the local, state, and national levels to help navigate the evolution of the visitor economy in Montana to become the second largest industry in the state. She wholeheartedly believes in the transformative power of travel, and she strives to showcase the beauty and opportunities that her chair state has to offer while helping communities create a diverse economic base that complements and aligns with the character and identity of each. Racine was a founding member of Tourism Matters to Montana and Voices for Montana Tourism, and a member of the board of the Blackfoot Challenge. Please welcome Racine Freedy. And I'm glad they're all sitting in order here, according to my notes, so that we can just go right down the line. Uh, <laughs> Hillary Rosner is an award-winning science journalist and the assistant director of the Center for Environmental Journalism at the University of Colorado in Boulder, where she oversees the Ted Scripps Fellowships. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, National Geographic, High Country News, Men's Journal, Audubon, Wired, and dozens of other publications. Her first book about knitting the planet back together for non-human species will be published by Patagonia Books next year. Please welcome Hilary Rosner. And last but not least, Michelle Uberaga is an environmental attorney, field organizer and researcher, and mother of three who's currently the senior program manager for Yellowstone with the National Parks Conservation Association. The former executive director of the Park County Environmental Council, Ubraga has also launched Mom's Clean Air Force chapter in Montana, which has grown to over 4,000 members. She has been a working advocate for conservation, climate, and public lands policy in Montana for over 15 years. Ladies and gentlemen, Michelle Ubraga. I'm gonna take this and sit down so I don't have to just glance over at everyone all the time, so. 
bear with me if I can figure this out. I can't figure this out. Yeah, that's what I should do. There we go. Didn't want to break anything. All right. Okay. Um, again, uh, thank you all for for coming, and let's get let's get this thing going. Um, Racine, I'd, I'd like to talk talk to you first to chat with you. You grew up in Montana. Um, what values exist here, and what has changed most in your mind over the years? Oh, I think that the, the values that we all share are just um, our independence, our free spirit, our, our love for the land and the people and the communities. Um, absolutely. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a multi-generational family. They were from the high line, but I grew up about an hour from here. I grew up in Ovando, Montana. That is an ag and timber and, um, and now somewhat tourism community. Uh, I've seen the ebbs and flows of our economy, and it's not always been pretty, and it's been pretty tough. Our little town uh, didn't have much there for many, many years. Um, but to tell you the truth, you look at things that are happening there now, and there is um, a real great balance of ag. There's a great balance of business. There's an accountant. There's a grocery store. And I'm just using Ovando as a, a great little example. Um, but now you look at Ovando being a little destination for tourism of people coming by and like, oh, I love the stray bullet and it's on the, the, the trail for the Continental Divide ride and it's one of the, the favorite spots for all the bicyclists that are, that are traveling that, that trail. Um, and, and what a, a, an amazing thing for that town because I can tell you the jobs that exist there, the businesses that exist there and the families that exist there actually wouldn't be there if there wasn't that diversity of the economy that is there right now. Now, um, if I go back and I, I visit, I've been blessed to be able to travel all across Montana my entire life and see the, I mean, oh, Chinook was a little Mayberry when I grew up and I went to visit my, my aunts and my uncles and my grandparents. And it was just perfect. It was just pristine and wonderful and you go back to it now and, and it kind of, it, it's, it's hard to see. It's, it's struggling, you know, the population has gone down, there's shuttered storefronts, um, things are tough. So when we look at this, there's a Western Montana aspect of tourism, but there's also an Eastern Montana aspect of tourism that we have to keep in mind. We've got maybe a lot more people here, there's a lot fewer people there, and the needs and desires and the values and are very different. And so we have to look at things as but more at a local level, at a county level, at a community level, rather than a statewide level. Yeah. Well, that's a great answer, and I, and I think we're going to be touching on, a lot, on that a lot uh, today in terms of different places requiring different, having different needs, uh, having different economies, having different values. Um, Hillary, you live in Colorado, where your uh, assistant director uh, at the Center for Environmental Journalism at CU Boulder. Um, what have you noticed about tourism and outdoor recreation in Colorado? How is it different, um, you know, from Montana, and, and, and how, is it, how is it similar? Yeah, um, I feel a little bit coming here like the um, ghost of Christmas future, <laughs> um, because I think in many ways, um, I don't think Montana is ever going to be Colorado. Um, but I do think that some of the stuff that's happening here is stuff that Colorado has been grappling with for, you know, the past 10 or 15 years. Um, so when I first moved to Colorado in 2002, um, you could park at a trailhead and go for a hike and you could um, go out on the weekend and go camping and you could find a dispersed camping spot on a Friday or you could go to a campground and pull in and get a spot. Um, you could go to a state park um, or a, you know, a, a sort of popular trailhead, but you could just kind of show up on a Saturday and park there and it was all fine. And um, that is not the case anymore. So um, my family goes camping a lot less now because you have to make a reservation six months in advance. And I'm not exaggerating about this. Um, I, I went camping two weeks ago with some friends, like two other families, and we 
Um, we made these reservations, I think, in April for August. And the only reason we chose the particular campground we did was because it was the only place that we could find within two hours of where we lived that had two campsites next to each other that we could reserve. <laughs> and, um, you know, the trailhead, I live, um, I'm fortunate enough to live uh, two blocks from a trailhead. I've been hiking this trail for 20 years. Um, I used to hike this trail and not see a soul. Um, now, you know, I, now I'm going to see people all the time. So it's not like it's, it's, um, you don't have to like make a reservation for parking at my local trailhead, but it definitely, you know, there's the trails are widening and kind of eroding a little bit from too much use or when it's muddy, people decide that they're going to go off the trail instead of walking through the mud um, in their brand new sneakers or whatever. So it really, you know, it is a, it is a, a noticeable change in the levels of people trying to get outdoors in Colorado. So just a follow up to that, you know, it just makes me think or wonder if 20 years ago when you first moved to Colorado, were these conversations happening when there, when there weren't hundreds of people at a trailhead? Uh, was, if, if this conversation had been uh, loving Colorado to death 20 years ago, would we, be, would we be having the same conversation that we're having today back there? Were people that concerned or was it, was it just happening? I think it happened very quickly in Colorado, quite honestly. Like I think the um I think when when the tech industry really came to Colorado, like that's when things shifted. Um and it was all, like almost overnight. Um there was a, a, a noticeable change. Um and I would say this was maybe like a dozen ish years ago. And then of course COVID just really exacerbated it. But I feel like it wasn't, these conversations might have been happening, but it's almost like the whole thing happened so quickly there wasn't even time to have a conversation about it. And now we're having the conversations, but now it's kind of too late. <laughs> Oof, got it. Um, well, Michelle, I, I want to turn to you. You've, you've been in Montana since 2005. Uh, you were executive director with Park County Environmental Council for nearly a decade before moving on to the National Parks uh, Conservation uh, Association. You know, when, while you were with PCEC, that we, we discussed a number of different polls that were conducted, uh, including one commissioned by uh, your org organization at the time. Tell us a little about those polls and really what stood out to you. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, my first home in Montana was Cook City, which is, um, uh, and I grew up in Mount Rainier National Park in a very small rural, uh, well, in government housing and, and a small rural place. And so Cook City felt like home. I don't know how many folks have been there, but it's, uh, there's big trees and people hide in the woods and it's lovely. Um, so I, w when I came to Montana, I, I started doing some work in Yellowstone. And Joe, as you said, I, um, I ended up uh, serving as executive director for Park County Environmental Council. And that's a role in which I, I really just left. Um, so uh, I, I had the great pleasure of working at the local level with a community, a gateway to a national park community, very similar to where I grew up. So I, I moved from Cook City to Gardner, bopped all over the state, including did some here in Missoula. <laughs> I'm a Grizz. And uh, Helena and uh, ended up in Livingston. So Livingston is the... Um, city. We call it the city of Livingston, which sometimes I think is odd because there's about 7,000 people and in the county there's about 16,000. And so that, that uh, I, th I think by calling C Livingston the city, it really reinforces our ideas about the urban-rural divide. But, but Livingston is really a, a, a nice small town, um, bigger than Cook. Um, so in my role at Park County Environmental Council, we're doing uh, Taking, you know, working to protect the lands, water, wildlife, and people in this gateway community. Um, something that makes Park County Environmental Council unique amongst conservation organizations uh, in the greater Yellowstone area is that we're, we're working at the community level. So we're working on 
issues that impact both public and private lands. And I think a lot of conservation groups focus on public lands, and there's a ton of public lands in Park County. Um, wilderness, the parks, I think we're 65% public lands. Um, but what happens on private lands really impacts our community, it impacts the public lands, it impacts the park, and so we, um, we have a long history of thinking about how we live and what the human footprint is in our community. Um, and, oh gosh, Joe, I even brought, um, I'm gonna pull out a prop. I brought a, a publication that PCEC did um, called Paving Over Paradise. This is well before my time, back in 2001, you know, right when the last big housing boom was happening. Um, so we've been thinking a long time about what it means to have more people on the landscape. This, this publication um, came out and there was a backlash. It, it really kind of scared people because um, it, there, at that time there was, uh, well, and, and I think there still is in Montana, uh, people, uh, real strong private property rights and a, and a fear of regulation. And, and I think when we're talking about people at the local level, in private lands, we have to talk about regulation. Um, so we did that, we've been working in this space. Fast forward um, to you know my time at PCEC, I started in 2016. Uh, we updated a growth policy that was outlined, kind of shared goals for our community. It was really thoughtful and uh, we had a lot of community support for it. And then the next step from that growth policy is, uh, how do we actually implement our shared values on the ground um, and that's when we start to get into the regulatory world and we start talking about the Z word, yeah. zoning. Um, and, and, and actually I have been in meetings with people where they, like, they're calling it the Z word or Zorro and um, you know, because there was a lot of fear around zoning and what that would mean in our county. Interestingly, Powell County, which is Ovanda, right? is one of the only counties in the state of Montana that has countywide zoning. And they did it early and really collaboratively, and I think in a really great way. It's an awesome model of how zoning can be used to really protect the working lands and ag producers. Um, so it's an excellent model, but uh, in Park County, we haven't had as much luck. Um, so we decided to do some, you know, let's, let's kind of, we get through the noise that comes on the social media, the Facebooks, and, and let's do some um, opinion polling. And so in 2022, we did, uh, Park County Environmental Council did an opinion poll. That was followed up by another uh, community organization called Friends of Park County. In Park County, we have two nonprofits that are working on land use planning issues, and that's feels pretty lucky, because um, these are big, important issues. Um, University of Montana did a poll, and then our community foundation did a survey. So there was four kind of data points that we were looking at. And um, what did you want to know about them? <laughs> I wanted to know what, what, what really jumped out at you with, with those, um, you know, specifically with your PCEC uh, polling. Yeah, the high, the high points. Um, I, I think, you know, a, a serious high point was that we have a ton of shared values. Like in the 90s, people really care about uh, public lands, clean water, the uh, natural resources, the beauty, access to those things. Like these are, we're, we're 90 to 96% of that, that, from those four, like kind of a collective of really high shared values. Um, concerns were also some of the, the, the number one concern does anybody want to guess? No? Close. That was up there. Housing, yes. Elizabeth. <laughs> um, yeah, so housing was the number one concern, affordability of housing. Um, and, then, and then after that, it was development. Um, and it, sprawl wasn't, it, it was more just development kind of generally. And a, a big concern about kind of high-end, uh, wealth, you know, uh, resort development in our community and industrial development. We've had a long history of kind of fighting industrial development. So those were the number one concerns. Um, and, and there was actually a lot of agreement on that we need to do something about it. And so that was really reassuring to us because, uh, you know, we, we wanted to find where is the common ground 
Like, how do we take that first step? We're not going to get countywide zoning as the first step, but what what is the first step that we can take to start putting some guardrails on the growth and development in our community? And uh, kind of the, the, the high level first place to start was um, kind of industrial and, and commercial development. Uh, and I thought that was interesting. I thought there would be a difference between industrial and commercial because you know we have a lot of small businesses and that's that's commercial development but but both of those types of development a uh, uh, large majority of of our respondents agreed that we needed to have some guardrails and some rules to regulate those and i could talk more about the poll but that's the high points yeah no that's great thank you very much uh for that you know and, and when we've been chatting over the last couple weeks uh just about you know how this is going to go how do we we talk about guardrails. How do we put guardrails on this conversation that we could talk for a week about? Um, but you know, we also recognize that you know we may not have the solutions. You know, in 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 journalism, it's not that we necessarily need to tell people what to think, but that we can provide them useful, data-driven, science-based information that they can therefore have an informed opinion. We can talk uh, about. Um, you know, voting and, and politics, you're not going to go there this, this time. But, you know, all of, all of this, this conversation, you know, one thing that really came up, and it's been mentioned already, Hillary, I believe you, you mentioned it, uh, is um, 2020. Uh, and we all remember where we were, um, you know, when our respective communities uh, began to be affected. Uh, I was running the newspaper in Big Sky that, that that Brad referred to, and you know, Big Sky Ski Resort shut down. And I remember having these conversations with my team and and with the community about, my God, what are we what are we going to do? Travel, travel stopped, and and biz these business owners were terrified. Um, Big Sky's economy is based on tourism, uh, and then it shifted, um, and the COVID pandemic brought throngs of of visitors and newcomers to the state. Uh, Racine, being in the business of bringing people to Montana, how did your company adjust to that influx? How did you guys, the P word, pivot? Oh, we got really good at pivoting. We've mm. pivoted so many times since that first occurred. Um, and our first pivot was we literally produced a video because we didn't know what was going on. We we're going, oh, this is going to be six weeks. This is going to be, two, you know, something like that. And we're going, it's, it's scary. And so we actually produced a video and said, you know, love us from afar. Don't come to Montana for now. Just kind of, you know, come back when it's safe, that kind of thing. And then all of a sudden, we started hearing all these reports from the communities. And there were people. There was a lot of people. And they weren't necessarily in the hotels, which was always been kind of our indicator cater of you know people on the ground and, and such but they were at their second homes they were airbnbs there were dispersed camping we were 50 percent public land in our region we're a eight county region um, of of mostly northwest montana including glacier and um and such and and so there's a lot of open public land and they were coming they were camping and it was all it was amazing but our communities were shut down. They didn't have employees. There was uh, uh, the supply issues. So if you take the same number of people from the previous year where you're operating at full capacity, and then suddenly you don't have that capacity, you're operating at a fraction of it, but you still layer in a bunch of people, that's tough. That's, that's when the panic starts hitting, and that's when people uh, struggling, you know, fam our communities are going, wait a minute, we, don't, we can't handle this, there's too many people on the ground. So we responded, the state was, um, had received some funding for safety messaging, and we worked with the state, all the DMOs across the state um, uh, got some funding, and we helped them with safety messaging. And it wasn't just COVID safety messaging, it was planning ahead, it was knowing before you go, it was um, layering in a lot of the recreate responsibly um, uh, principles and such. And we had six months to get that out and done. Well, we realized as of January of 2021, that was still really, really important because there was a new visitor on the ground. There was a new person 
that was in Montana. We've been blessed with people that were coming here that knew how to recreate, that knew what to do, when, uh, knew how to travel in rural America. Um, but now we've got this new person that suddenly popped up there. They left urban place. They got an RV. It's brand new. I mean, they didn't know what they were doing. And um, we started hearing these horror stories about trash and rudeness and people um, having all these high expectations of, of rural living when that's not what it's like. That's, that's, you don't get that in, in rural America. So we actually kept our campaign, our entire campaign for the year of 2021 was strictly recreate responsibly. It was an awareness campaign, getting um, to people who had an intent that already were gonna come here, or trying to message the people on the ground to please be kind to our residents, to please think ahead, please uh, don't do things outside your skill level. I mean, who, who would have guessed that we, we would have had to be having this kind of messaging? Um, and we actually kept that into 2022 because we still had a lot of people on the ground. Um, 2023 started to change. We started to hear, you know, um, the shoulder season, so fall, winter, spring. We're trying to get our communities back on the ground. Hotels started coming back online. So we, we were in recovery mode. Um, so we were very selective about what we were promoting, when we were promoting it, but we knew we had to be really conscientious about what we were doing. And so in January of 2021, we didn't, went into a strategic planning session with our board and we went, what we've been doing for the past 30 years isn't, that's not who we need to be right now. And this new concept called destination stewardship came about. And I can remember the board just going, yes, that's who we need to be. And destination stewardship was very new at that time. And what it is, is it is about looking at seasonal community capacity and looking at resident quality of life and community identity and how do you balance that um, with the visitation, with the visitor quality of experience. And I have to tell you, I freaked out. I'm like, how do you do that? that that's, that's impossible. Um, but the board was like, no, we've got to do this. And so um, we had some puzzle pieces that fell into place. Within four months, we had started our destination stewardship planning process. And a year later, uh, I believe it was summer of 2022, we had a destination stewardship plan in place. And the entire plan was based on what we heard from our communities. It wasn't the board, it wasn't us, it wasn't the industry necessarily that led this plan. We went into the communities and they told us what they wanted. We went into every single county. What does Sanders County want? What does Glacier County want? What does Lincoln County want? And we pulled this all together and um, we are now in the implementation mode. It's a 10 year plan. But I can tell you, it is not something easy to do and it is not something, we've completely changed our mind shift where it's not us just kind of leading, operating behind the scenes and, and doing our thing anymore. We're working with the community. We're having conversations. We're trying to bring everybody to the table. We're fostering relationships with our conservation organizations and our public land managers and our businesses and the residents. It is a much, much bigger conversation. And so that's really this shift that has occurred. Um, the other piece of the puzzle that happened during COVID is yes, we had remote workers, we had remote learners, we had this new novice recreationist. We also had the new resident that came in and so there was that added kind of congestion in a town that might not have otherwise been maybe that, that congested. So you had three different things all happening at once and you could just feel the tension. You could just feel the change in the community. So there's been a lot of changes um, occurring, um, but COVID was a big shift, I think, for everyone. Yeah, I'm, you know, I imagine it takes a lot of trust to work with communities. You know, you guys have been polling, you know, we did, did a number of those polls in Park County. Um, well, first off though, Racine, how effective was it? I mean, did you find it that uh, destination stewardship is working? So it's a new concept, right? We're only, what, a year and a half into implementation phase of a 10-year plan. We spent a good part of the winter going out and talking about the plan to the, all the communities that we talked about or talked with originally. And the, the concept, people were like, yes, 
that makes sense, yes. Um, it has been very well received. Um, and what we also did is we looked at, we, uh, we asked a whole series of questions. What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? When are there too many people? When are there too few people? I mean, we asked a ton of questions. And then we answered the same, we asked the same questions when we went back. And then we compared the answers. Um, some things had improved. Mostly it's very similar. But you know what? It set the bar. We now know what our foundation, what our bar is that we've got to start working against. Um, but now people are, are really going, okay. And we've had, we had at least, we had one community in particular, we didn't expect this. We went in, we had this conversation, it turned really super dynamic, and it was just a conversation. And at the end, I'm like, okay, so um, what, what would you like to see from us next? And they said, when can you come back? We, wanna ha we want this conversation to continue. When can you come back? So, um, and in other communities, it did not go as well. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of fear. Um, and also, in one of those meetings, those were the words we were using, and one of the, the, the ladies who was in the room said, that's not the right word. And all of a sudden, she stood up right in the middle of the meeting, and she goes, it's grief. It's not fear of change, it's grief. We're going through the stages of grief because the community we have, we grew up with is no longer. So we'll get there. We're just grieving right now. And I just, that was very powerful to me. That, you know, that is, that is sad to hear. I think people, people don't typically adjust to change all that well. I mean, things changed in Colorado. Um, Are people mean in Colorado? Are your visitors angry? <laughs> um, I mean, or do are they? Or they? Do they not know how to act? Joe. There are just mean people everywhere. There are even mean people in Montana. <laughs> Mostly nice. <laughs> Mostly nice, though. Um, yeah, well, I was just going to ask. You know, what, I guess what you you know have you seen any of this destination stewardship going on in, in Colorado in your communities uh, down there and. And if so, how has that been received? I mean, I, I love that phrase, destination stewardship. I've actually never heard that phrase before. So um, if it is being done in this way in Colorado, I, I'm not aware of it. Um, but I do think, you know, I think the issues are, are similar. And actually, so in the reporting for my book, I just traveled to, you know, several different states and also several different countries. And a lot of the themes are the same everywhere, right? So I was reporting um, in a part of Costa Rica that is like relatively undeveloped compared to other parts of Costa Rica. And they had a similar thing, right? So like during the pandemic, there were a lot of wealthy Americans who were, you know, instead of moving to Montana, they moved to Costa Rica. Um, and there are people who um, kind of ostensibly went there to appreciate the wildlife and the beauty and the, you know, open space but then build these mansions and put up giant fences that actually block you know, wildlife from moving. And so I think there's, there's a couple different things going on, right? Like there are the kind of people who are recreating the destination stewardship kind of thing. There are the people who are coming and just wanna go to Rocky Mountain National Park and are you know, um, just increasing the crowds and everything there. And then there's also the people who are moving into places where they don't really understand the landscape and the ecosystem and how their um, private land and private decisions have these kind of ripple effects. That's, that's really interesting to hear and, and you know, not entirely surprising, not entirely different uh, from the situation in Montana, maybe a little more advanced. Um, well, Michelle, I, I, I'd like to ask you then, so what, like, all right, I wanna actually ask all three of you, if you don't mind. Um, like what, what, people have been moving to the West, to new places for a very long time. Um, is it just that it's in such a concentrated group of numbers that, that why, why we're seeing these impacts? How do people suddenly not know how to recreate outside in a respectful way? It's so weird. Um, and I like I love uh, 
Racine hearing about um, destination stewardship, I was thinking, do we have that in Yellowstone country? I don't know, but um, I hope so. What we, you know, what I have heard and what we have talked about is um, sustainable destinations, and that's I think Jackson Hole is one, and there are some in Colorado, and you you know you can get the um, certified as a sustainable destination, and there's like a whole process for that. Um, but I like destination stewardship a lot better. I think that's really good, and I, I would I would love um, to start thinking about that in our community. It's just a little bit more, uh, but sustainable is kind of a nebulous word. And um, and then there's all these like things you have to do versus like allowing a community to define stewardship. What does stewardship look like to us in our community? And I so I really love that. Why are people um, recreating I, I, the way they are? I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but it is something we, um, we talk a lot about and I, I have another prop. Um, <laughs> I just brought some stuff from home. But what we did was uh, we put together a, a, what we called the Paradise Pledge in our community. And the Park County Environmental Council partnered with um, our chambers to put that together and to get it out into local businesses. And the Paradise Pledge is, I mean, it's just, you can go online. It's just basically, I don't know if I can, look at my mom bag. I got so many things in here. Um, Oh, not that one. Yeah, it's a little folder, and it just says, you know, when I pledge when exploring, I will, you know, be kind and respectful, practice the principles of leave no trees, learn how to poop in the woods, and that's um, like for our in, in in Park County, we've got the Yellowstone River running right down the middle of the valley, and um, and there are a lot of rules that I think that we maybe all inherently understand about being on a river and recreating if we grew up in a place and that folks just don't know, like how to go to the bathroom on the river. And uh, yeah, and, and in our, we've got a watershed group in the river and there's a lot of uh, private landowners and they're, they're saying like, like people are coming up out of their boats and like going to the bathroom in their yard. Like they can see it from their windows. I mean, that's absurd. I, it's like, but I, but people don't know. Um, and yeah, I don't know why they, but um, I think I already shared that I grew up in a national park. So I think that I was indoctrinated very early with the um, principles. When we, uh, whenever we leave the campground, we do litter patrol, all the kids, you know do litter patrol and look up, look for the micro trash. And um, yeah, so I, I don't know, but I, I do think it's it's um, more and more people, new people and um, and how do, we have a, a responsibility to be stewards and teachers. And um, this is just, yeah, one example of, of what our community has done. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And you know, what I'm hearing from, especially from you, Hillary and Racine is, going into communities, talking to them, asking them what they want. I mean, that's what can build trust. Uh, you know, the destination stewardship idea um, and the sustainable communities concept are, are s similar, I think. Um, but in Park County, for example, you know, how is, what is coming out of the polls and what is the community doing to respond to the way that these respondents have said they're concerned about these things. I mean, you you, you mentioned um, some zoning uh, and and some some sustainable planning, but yeah, I didn't know if if there were specific other specific ways that Park County is responding. Um, you know, in in Park County, we not only had COVID, but then we had Gardner downtown Gardner burned. We lost like half of Gardner, and then um, and then the floods. So the word grief is, is a real word. Like that's like devastation in our community. Um, so the, the conversations are, we're having conversations around resilience, you know, and how do we, um, I, I, when I started at Park County Environmental Council, we were fighting gold mines on the border of Yellowstone. And I remember the, um, mining company coming to town and like touting their jobs. And that was 2016. And at that point, people were like, ah, 20 hour, I mean, we could earn, we're already, our businesses, our tourism economy, we're already, I, you know, we're earning that. We don't, the, and, and you're 
mines threaten that economy that we have, our clean water, our public lands, our wildlife. So it was a, ver a, a conversation of how dependent we are. Um, and, uh, and then I, you know, and kind of like saying, well, we already have the jobs. But now uh, there was another developer coming, and he was at a city commission meeting talking about the jobs. And everybody was like, you could just hear the like air in the room. It was like, we don't need jobs. <laughs> we need affordable we need housing, we need employees, like the business owners. Um, so after we did that polling, the, I, I, I said that housing was one of the top issues. I think that also makes Park County Environmental Council a very unique nonprofit, although on the other end of the, uh, of the ecosystem in Jackson, their community conservation group is working on housing, um, the Jackson Hole Conservation Alliance. And I collaborated a lot, learned from them. But we partnered with many different community partners and we were able to pass a housing action plan. Um, that was not without controversy, um, but, but we did. Um, and we, there was uh, a lot of opposition, to, or hmm, there was opposition to that, which kind of caused uh, a ballot initiative recently to overturn our growth policy. The growth policy is the foundational document you need to do any planning in your community. Um, is there anybody from Hamilton in the room? Uh, well, they lost their growth policy, unfortunately, and Ravalli County, um, you, you gotta get real creative when you don't have those foundational tools for planning. So there was a threat on ours, and, and our community rallied together and said, no, we really, we, we value planning, we defended the growth policy, and now we're working to make it even stronger. So there's a new effort to kind of update it. You know, I think that um, uh, getting to that step where we're actually putting those guardrails on, I, I, it's we're still a little ways away from that, but I think it's possible. The city of Livingston, on the other hand, uh, another thing that our polls said, huge margins of people agreed that we have housing as a problem, um, but we want to see that development in uh, our already populated areas. We want dense infill, and the city of Livingston updated their growth policy, and they are um, Im implementing regulations to really incentivize infill development, not sprawl. Um, we got bear-proof garbage cans. Um, so the city of Livingston is, and, and I would say residents in Livingston are saying, yes, we need to like infill, we're ready to absorb the growth here so that we can protect the rural way of life. And that, that's, that's a win-win, right? Our rural neighbors want that, we want that, we all wanna protect open space, ag land. Um, and, and so th I think that that's cool and there's a lot more opportunities there. You know, you look over the hill in Bozeman and I, I think that the infill Maybe the community said yes to Inville, but there's also a lot of opposition. I, I, there may be some folks here that live in Bozeman, but there's like save Bozeman signs from the big housing, you know, like we do have to grow in our urban environments and I'm happy to say that our community is really on board for that. Yeah, you know, I just wanna, based on you know that answer, I'll just share a few stats um, here and I'd love to, uh, Racine to, um, to jump in here in a second with, with some of her own, but um, over $236 million is spent in Park County by out-of-state travelers. Um, you know, visitor spending creates 3,270 jobs and contributes to local and state taxes. Um, I think I think it goes back to a word, Racine, that you, or I believe you brought up earlier, balance, right? So, you know, there's a fine line between boosting the economy uh, through tourism and hurting businesses by essentially having too many people that don't know how to go to the bathroom on the river by themselves or, you know. Uh, so talk about the idea of balance there. Yeah, st uh, stewardship, and, and again, it's it's not easy. Um, and we're coming out of probably the most turbulent times we'll hopefully ever see. Um, but there was no way it came out of the blue, it was, absolutely unexpected, nobody had a clue that these kind of things were going to occur from 2020 to 2023. Um, and we've been, one of the things that I, we're really focused on is data because we didn't have data before. It was, 
uh, or we were monitoring lodging tax collections or we were hearing from hoteliers what their occupancy was and all that kind of stuff. Well, now we have a ton of data and we're monitoring it very, very closely. Um, we've always had ITRR, um, Institute for Tourism and Recreation Research, here at the University of Montana. We've been blessed to have them from the very beginning of the lodging tax creation in the state of Montana. And so they've been monitoring ever since, let's see, 1991 is when they started monitoring um, non-resident visitor spend. 1994 is when they started monitoring the number of visitors. Um, and from the first time that they started, uh, we had approximately 7 million people that were visiting in Montana at that time, so in the early 90s. Now it's 12.5. But interestingly enough, if you look at the last seven or eight years, it's 11 million, 12, 11.9. It's relatively been stable, but it's, uh, the visitor spending has been off the charts. Um, and of course, a lot of that is inflation and, and um, cost of travel. Uh, the United States is known internationally right now as one of the most expensive places to travel. In fact, I was, uh, I, I have, I have two employees that are going to Europe in the next two weeks. Um, and when you look at the, the cost to travel to Europe, even though the euro exchange rate with the US dollar is pretty um, even, hotels are half the rate. You can get a ho or an airplane from Paris to Rome for 100 bucks. You can't do that here. Um, and our US dollar is incredibly strong. Uh, outside of Europe, you start looking at exchange rates, even with our neighbors to the north right now, uh, we can go to Canada and our dollar's worth a dollar 37 there. It is really affordable for us to go to Canada right now. And so, but it's not affordable for them and we've seen a huge decrease in Canadian visitation and that has really hurt the northern tier of Montana because they aren't coming down, they aren't doing their shopping, they aren't doing any of that. And, this is an interesting fact too, so many Canadians used to have second homes here. During COVID, they sold them. They actually divested their second homes down here. And so they are not here like they used to be. So we, we love data. <laughs> We love data. Um, now, visitor spending, though, I will say, uh, visitor spending, when they first started monitoring, it's like $1.2 billion, which was huge. I, I was working at the Bozeman Chamber way back then, and that was a lot of money then. Um, this year, or in 2023, they spent $5.45 billion, and that's just non-residents. That's not residents. Um, we are now one of the top two industries in the state of Montana, and the only other, the other one that and there's a little bit of a competition between us, um, is ag. But the Department of Labor in Montana includes natural resource extraction with traditional ag. It's all one. I think we're number one. Um, so, but that's a, that's a significant amount. And during the last legislative session, during one of the um, Department of Revenue reports, we're also, okay, I need to explain this a little bit. In 1987, there's a 4% lodging facility use tax that was created that was assessed on occupied room nights. In 2003, there was another 4% lodging facility sales and use tax that was created on the exact same rooms, only they added in rental cars into the mix on that one. So there's 8% that's tacked on to your hotel uh, when you travel in Montana. So, but where that money goes is completely different in those two taxes. So the first one goes to a whole series of different people, Department of Commerce, State Parks, ITRR, DMOs like us, um, uh, uh, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. There's a whole distribution there. But over on the other side, 75% of that goes to the Montana General Fund. So for every dollar right now that is being generated in lodging tax, there is 75% that's going directly into the general fund. So there is, uh, uh, this, is a, this, is, this is industry in Montana. This is, this is funding a lot of different things. Um, and so when I talk about stewardship, we do have a responsibility to try to sustain tourism to the point where the businesses that rely on us can still stay in business. 
we have we have that responsibility and that weighs really really heavy on us because there's also times when we know we there's too many people yeah. we we got to we got to we're going to have to make some changes and so we might have to pull back on what we're doing but we're going to shift to bring people in during times that there is capacity so we're trying to take the bell out of the mix and flatten it more. So there's, again, data, numbers, evolution, very, very complex. So, you know, and that, that's huge, huge numbers. I mean, $5.45 billion, uh, a lot of money. Um, you know, the other side of that, again, is, is you know, the, the environment, the impact, right? Um, Hillary, I was just, you, you mentioned your book. I wanted to, you to talk just a little bit more um, that's coming out next year about humans dissecting uh, wildlife corridors in various ways, disrupting animal behavior. Can you tell us just a little more about your research and, and uh, the book that's coming out? Yeah, so I, I was thinking actually, as both these guys were talking now just about um, this idea of stewardship and how, like what we're really thinking about when we like, go to a new place and when we sort of exist on the land. And again, like I'm thinking a lot about these ripple effects. Um, so my book is about this idea of connectivity um, in a very broad sense. So when we think about um, wildlife connectivity, which is an ecological term, like it, we tend to think about like linear ways, like how does an animal get from point A to point B, that which could either be a seasonal migration or just like in its daily you know, path to just kind of get what it needs. So I'm thinking about that and how all of our human infrastructure has um, upset that and basically stopped animals, non-human species from being able to get where they need to go in their daily lives. Um, I'm also thinking about connectivity on a, on a functional, in a functional way. So instead of a linear way, how does the, what I have just done, you know, whether it's building my house in this wildlife corridor or putting up a fence or building a road or paving over paradise, how does this impact the um, functional integrity of an ecosystem? And how does that sort of impact all these non-human species from being able to go about their lives? And then I'm also thinking about something that um, is a, a term that I've heard called umbilical connectivity, which is really about our connection to nature. Um, and so again, like when I think about tourism here and all of the people coming here and all the people flocking to visit Yellowstone, um, I think a lot of those people, everyone who's going to Yellowstone is going because they want to see wildlife for the most part, right? Like they want to see a grizzly bear, they want to see a wolf. Um, but they're not really thinking about those animals, and they're not really thinking about the world from the point of view of those animals, right? And so where do those animals go um, in the course of their life, right? Like they don't just stay in the park, they have to move out of the park. And so wait a minute, what happens if I decide I wanna move here, but I'm gonna build my house like right here in the path of, that these elk have been using for millennia to migrate out of the park, and I think part of that connectivity piece is actually trying to connect people, whether they are um, you know, tourists or people moving to a new community, to the, like the, the nature that surrounds them and really make them think from the point of view of a different species, right? Like we just don't tend to think about how our actions impact other species. We're just like, oh, I wanna put my house here and I want, you know, it, there's this great view and there's this creek running through, but like, what does that do to the ecosystem and the natural world that you have ostensibly moved there and put your house there to appreciate? Um, so that's kind of partly what the book is about. Yeah, <laughs> I'm very much looking forward to it. We just, you know, just reading uh, Crossings by Ben Goldfarb, and, and that's a terrific book as well uh, for folks to better understand the ways in which we are impacting, dissecting, um, you know, the, the wildlife corridors, the wildlife areas, the, the wildlands that, that make these places so special. Um, well, we're gonna be wrapping us up here shortly uh, so we can take some of your questions, um, but not yet. I got, I got a couple more. Um, I'll be fast. Uh, so solutions, balance, you know, things like responsible, responsible, responsible growth. I don't, you know, if that actually exists. 
Um, they're difficult to come by, right? Uh, and they're very different for different communities was something that you and all, you all and I have uh, discussed and, and a lot of people recognize that. Um, you know, Racine, how can various communities with different needs and interests approach communicating those needs and, and reaching their objectives? It all has to do with communication. It, people have got to foster relationships and remember that we're all, we're all in this together. Um, most of the community meetings that we hold, we've got a very diverse group of people in the room. And when we, when we have those conversations, and it's, we're not there as that full-on advocate of tourism. We're there as, what are the common goals here? What do we, uh, I was on the board of the Blackfoot Challenge, a uh, local watershed group for, for 13 years. And I was at the table when uh, one of the local ranchers, uh, Dave Mannix said, you know, this, this group of people is about bringing everybody to the table, about um, public managers, private sector, NGOs, ranchers, the whole nine yards, everybody comes to the table. We throw all the, all the issues out on the table and we figure out the 20% that we all agree on and we wipe off the 80% that we don't. And let's focus on the 20% that we can. And you gotta start small. And I think um, we've got several communities that we're having some conversations with. That's where they are starting. They, were, they said, you know, there's, we've been working on these issues, there's friction, we gotta figure out how we can work together. And that's what it really is all about. And hopefully we can get to the point where we can do that 2080 split. Oh, that's, that's great, to, really interesting to hear. Thank you for that. I, uh, so I, I wanted, I think the last thing I just was curious about, and this is something John Adams and I were talking about, uh, I believe with all, uh, we were all discussing this. You know, what, what role, I, I'd say all of you, but Hillary, maybe we could uh, start with you. What, what role do political leaders, um, you know, elected officials play, uh, you know, on the state level, for example, in, the, in this discussion? Oh, it's, oh, for, it's for sorry, me. Michelle. You said Hillary. Yeah. yeah. I don't know uh, anything about that. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I was, <laughs> um, uh, well, I, I was thinking um, as uh, Racine, you were talking about the tax um, and the, the this billion dollar industry and it's bringing tax and that's a hot topic in our community um, because and I, you know, it's a lot of it's kind of social media e, and I don't know that people fully understand, but like that we, we in Park County, Montana, the gateway to Yellowstone, we are hosting millions of people, and we don't have. Uh, we need a well-funded local government, and so when the tourism dollars, the complaint that I have heard is our bed taxes are going to Helena, you know, and they're going into the general pot when we. Um, we don't, we need, the, our uh, volunteer firefighters and our emergency services, just the expense for our local community to deal with the traffic on the road is tremendous. Um, so one place that we have found common ground in our community is around the tourism um, tax, you know, and uh, the resort tax. And Gardner has a resort tax. Whitefish has one, maybe West Yellowstone does. It's a really great way that that community can um, uh, get some additional funding from all of the, the visitors coming through. Um, unfortunately, Livingston's too big. We might need to, um, well, we have had, so Livingston's too big. The, the statute, the law that allows communities to be resort tax, says you have to be 5,000 people or less. So I think Whitefish got in right under the wire when they were still that small. Livingston were like 7,000. So we cannot get a resort tax in place. Um, and we've seen real diverse uh, community leaders, elected officials coming together to go to Helena to um, change that. Uh, and it's been quite a few years in a row and they, we haven't had luck. Uh, it's, a, yeah, it's, it's, a hard, it's a hard issue. Um, so yeah, I mean, we need people in Helena that are thinking about, and I will agree with Racine, our, our, the biggest economy in this state is tourism. Why are people coming to this state? They're coming because 
It's beautiful. We've got open lands, blue ribbon trout fishing, wildlife. Uh, the wildlife viewing industry in our community is millions, I, millions, I, I promise not to like say the wrong number, <laughs> millions of dollars. Uh, in, in Park County, we have a group of uh, businesses called Wild Livelihoods, and, and these are individuals, their livelihoods depend upon um, going into the park and unseen wildlife. Uh, after this, the last, I don't know which legislative session, I think it was 2021, when uh, we opened up wolf hunting across the state in a, a whole new way, and um, we lost an entire pack of Yellowstone wolves on the north entrance. And these are wolves that are um, reliable. They, they don't understand the difference when they walk outside the north entrance. Um, and and the, the, the guides, the, the, those are, that's their bread and butter. That's the, this is the goose that you know laid the golden egg, right? The, is this beautiful place that we all love. And I think we, we really need um, folks in Helena to understand that a part of continuing to have a thriving, diverse, unique state that we're all very proud to call home, we need to have, we need to be protecting those, those natural resources in a, in a new and different way. And if I could just add to that, I know I keep drilling the same point home, but I think like that's so important. And part of what is important about that is somehow making sure that the message is put out that like it's not just in the park, right? Like people need to understand that if they want to see the animals in the park, they need to be protecting the movement corridors and the places that those animals exist on private lands and you know outside and public lands outside of the park. And that's they, very hard to do. I mean, it's. I mean, there are a lot of. We've got tools that are working, but it's. It's. Yeah, it's hard. Well, um, thank you, ladies, very much. Uh, we'd love to turn it over to any questions that the audience uh, might have. Um, yes. Uh, recently, Glacier kind of started restricting entry by with a ticketed system and I know Colorado has all kinds of permitted areas um, I'm curious your thoughts on doing that to preserve the natural resources you know is it necessary then that we have to say some people just can't go there so glaciers system is very different than the other national parks across the country in that there's ticketed entry and it's by person and such. And um, when people talk about the vehicle reservation system in Glacier and they say, I can't get into the park. First thing I say, I can get into the park without a vehicle reservation system any day of the year. The only thing that the vehicle reservation system in Glacier is doing is trying to manage the number of people that are in the park at any one time to disperse visitors throughout the day. In fact, I was just, or just on a phone call with the park the other day. And they've gone through, what is this, the fourth pilot program? I think this is the fourth year, and they've changed it every single year. They're like adjusting it. Um, and this year, they also made it so you didn't need a vehicle reservation if you were coming in from the east side um, to get to the, going to the Sun Road. And to tell you the truth, I, it's, it's not a bad thing. If I go into the park now, it's like it was when I was a kid. It's not nearly as congested as it used to be, but it's still accessible. Now, I don't know if that would work because I can tell you one thing, the entity that hates that plan the most are the residents. They do not like it. Um, and I get it, I get both sides, totally understand. Um, I, just know if, I just don't know if there's a, I firmly believe these days there's no one size fits all for anything. I don't I, I I think it all has to be developed on at the community or the local level and 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 figured out what what are the needs, the desires and and how does it make it work and and be flexible and pivot. Get really good at pivoting. Um, in their mind they can't get into the park anytime they want. Is there a way to like exempt locals from that? Is no. there some No, it's a exemption? national park. So they've, they've gone through this discussion quite a bit. You can't give pressure on preferential treatment to it's the any particular entity. 
Yeah, that's like the law. Yeah, right. Like it's it's not our as much as people that live at the adjacent to parks believe that they are theirs. They're yeah. not. But again, well, but I mean, I, it is lo like local communities adjacent to the park are obviously being impacted, and so it, yeah. I yes, absolutely. Um, and they can still get in. They could get in before six or after three. And I would say that this uh, is coming to Yellowstone too. Uh, and and to to Racine, to your. Um, I, I was just at a conference in Big Sky with uh, was the 16th biannual Greater Yellowstone, all the coordinating committees. It was all the uh, agency folks and the superintendents from both Teton and Yellowstone. And so, um, and they were, uh, Cam Shawley, the superintendent of um, Yellowstone, was talking about how during, uh, during the COVID, they, they had to pivot to figure out how to do entry and they went to an alternating license plate system and he, he yeah and he was saying that he like that came like somebody they were at a community meeting in west yellowstone and somebody emailed him at midnight and he thought it was a crazy idea and then they just decided to try it and um so i i, I yeah i think that 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 we do have to manage people in order to um protect what we love and and we have to be creative and yeah um, I just want to add one thing to that. Um, so I, I wrote in my book about a really interesting study um, that took place in Italy where they used um, Strava data combined with, um, you know, wildlife camera trap information to, to basically see what impact humans, the presence of humans was having on wildlife movement, not in terms of our infrastructure, but like just the actual presence of humans. And so we tend to not really think about like hikers on a trail as something that has much impact, right? Like we tend to think about, you know, cars and motorized recreation and things like that. But like just the presence of people hiking on a trail does actually have an impact on wildlife. Um, and so I, I do feel that like everyone should get out into nature and hike and I don't think that there should be restrictions on that. But I do think that we need to recognize that, right? And it should be part of the conversation is that like just our, you know, even like the people who think like, oh, I'm just kind of like hiking through, like you are actually impacting, um, you know, how bears kind of move around just by your presence. And so it is something that we just need to be aware of. I think the education around being wildlife wise is a so critical, and it, we can't let off the gas on that particular case. And case. as, a, as a, a parent, I think if there was really clear notification, like, we, there are a lot of bears in Paradise Valley and around. If there was like, hey, bear in the area, maybe just avoid that trailhead, or even let's shut down a trailhead if we know that there's a mom, like a, Seuss Creek, there's a mama moose and a baby up there, and you don't want them, like, maybe we should temporarily shut down trailheads when we know that there are, there's active wildlife in there, and we're doing that for the wildlife, and we can also pitch it as a safety for our communities. Great answers, all three of you, that was wonderful. Um, I've got one up here. Very interesting. Oh, back there, yeah. Um, I guess this question might be better for Michelle to answer first, but um, I'm sure that you all have uh, valuable insights. Uh, I'm working on a, a project looking at the plug outside of Cook City, and it's looking like a possibility that in the coming years they might think about plowing that. Uh, what do you think that through traffic in Yellowstone in the winter time would do to uh, the nature of the park and then also communities like Gardner and Livingston. I love that you're getting like deep into the weeds, the plow, the plug. <laughs> um, yeah, so that that is a hot topic. Um, and, you know, also, the, the, Joe, your question about what what's the importance of elected officials in Helena and getting the right people, it, it's equally important to get good people at the local level. And, and I would say even perhaps more important to get good people at the local level and then make sure that folks in Helena are letting local decisions. Um, so in Cook City, plow, plow the plug, I there's 120 registered voters somewhere in there, and they're pretty evenly split on whether to plow the plug, um, which would open up visitation. You know, Cook City is a dead end for folks that aren't familiar with it in the winter. You can only get there through the Lamar Valley. Um, and uh, personally, I do, would not want to see the plug plowed. That way I'm uh, on the other side. I do not think we should plow. Um, 
And I think that there's, it's an interesting divide in the community because uh, there's a lot of recreational opportunities that are happening there because it's not plowed. You know, they're like it's a snowmobile community. It's a lot of their unique identity is kind of that dead end. Don't you know? Uh, you you can't. You can only get in out in and out through the Lamar Valley. Um, and I I have spoken to. I I don't know who would plow the plug. So I think actually the thing that's going to save us is the fact that it's cost a lot of money to plow roads and there there's there's no there's nobody in cooks there's you know we're in a space where just hiring enough people to run the businesses is, is hard with housing and so we don't have extra people or money to plow the plug the park service is not going to plow the plug park county is not going to do it. So I don't know who would, um, and that might save us in the end. Um, do you guys know about, the, do you want to talk about the plug? <laughs> <laughs> do you? Yeah, from uh, the DMO world in Montana, we're pretty tight. <laughs> we talk a lot. Where's the Gardner Chamber at on it? I can't remember where oh, they're the Oh, we don't. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, the Cook City Chamber. Uh, the, oh, uh, they do not, the DMOs are the ones that receive the tax funds. Oh, okay. So, yep. you don't, okay. Yep. I can't recall where the Cook City Chamber sits on this issue. The Gardner Chamber tends to be very uh, natural resource protection minded, and I, I'm not as familiar with the Cook City one. I'm all about local decisions. That's, that's one of the things that we as an organization do is we don't take positions on, on anything at the local level. Um, we just, it needs to be local decisions whatsoever. So no matter what. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. I, I mean, especially if they're so evenly split, it sounds like the decision might be tougher to come by, of course. But again, having somebody else make that decision for you may not be what local residents want. And, and there, I do think there will be significant impacts on wildlife, which I think was your question, which maybe I did not say. That, yeah, there, that's why I would not want to see that plow. Yeah, definitely. All uh, right, yes. Oh, Ann? Oh. Come down here. Yeah. Here we go. Oh, thank you. I almost tripped. Thanks. Um, really interesting discussion. And Michelle, I live in Park County, so I appreciate all the work you've done and all the information today. Um, while you were talking about destination stewardship, I looked it up on my phone, not to be rude, but I was curious. There are a lot of destination stewardships, including one in Colorado, at least of the headline. So it's a concept that's out there. Right. But I also think as interesting and intriguing as it is for those of us who hear that term for the first time, I'm sure everybody has a different de definition in their mind. So the more descriptive we can be about exactly what that means, um, the better. And one question I have about living in the northern part of Mar Park County and driving into Bozeman, Gallatin County, the, the road changes immediately. The minute you get into Gallatin County, they have more money. <laughs> and the road has far fewer potholes. Um, the, has any and, and thinking about how to support Park County handling the influx. And by the way, the elephant in the room about moving here is not just COVID, it's the Yellowstone TV series. Everybody think it's just really created wild, a yeah. romantic and I, I've actually watched one episode. I felt like I had to, but um, I don't know. But it has really drawn people to Montana, especially Park County. And um, has anybody ever thought, or, or what is the status of, of the idea of a transfer tax for people moving here? I, I know someone who moved here during COVID and were, they were surprised, to Bozeman, were surprised there wasn't such a thing as a transfer tax. And I guess there is in other communities, but um, that would be something for Park County. There's been so many ranches sold at the top of the market with generational shifts and families and stuff that um, that would have been a source of revenue for Park County to take care of itself and its roads. And I'm just wondering if that is even on the table, if, what do you guys think about it? Um, well, I'll, I can get specific and then maybe you, know, you guys can talk more about uh, tax policy, but um, uh, I definitely have heard 
and then in, in very diverse rooms, we have a, a, one of my dear friends is an incredibly uh, kind, very, very conservative um, gentleman who, who fills Mr. Brian Wells, county, county commissioner. We, we don't see eye to eye on, on a lot, but we see eye to eye on a lot, I guess. We just vote differently. Um, but we ha he's holding these community conversations, bringing people together to kind of workshop. And I would say, uh, I've heard over and over again, um, why can't we tax out of state develop, why can't we tax differently for um, development? And that, that would be a really, people would really like to see that. Um, and I've heard of transfer tax. I think that came, and I, so I will just admit that I have not, dove into the tax code to really understand what's possible in Montana, which is why what it, we know is possible is the resort tax. Um, the other things we have are building um, building fees. We didn't, with the update of the growth policy, we started doing, uh, you, you know, actually requiring when new big resorts come in for them to pay a fee. Um, those are impact fees. We didn't have that anywhere in Park County until pretty recently. Um, so I think they're trying to think about how do we get more dollars so we can put back in to actually manage all the people. Um, but I think that we also have um, in Helena a lot of roadblocks because it, there, there's a lot of opposition to, I think, tax in general in Montana, um, except for me. I love paying my taxes. All of them for all the teachers, for all of the things. Um, uh, I'm quite engaged with uh, le the legislative session and I've been watching some of these task force pretty closely. And there's some really interesting concepts that are coming out of these task force. And, it, and I, one of them is to um, increase uh, property taxes on second homes. I mean, keep them or lower them for uh, primary resident owned homes, They're, that's their primary residence, but then significantly increasing taxes for the out-of-state owner and stuff. And I went, ooh, that's, that's an interesting idea. But there's, a, there's the big ones, there are a couple different big topics. This legislative session is gonna take up the air in the entire session. Housing, taxes, education, and um, Medicare, or Medicaid expansion. Those are the big ones. And so, you know, kind of monitoring where all those different programs are coming into place because to housing and, and all of that, it all directly impacts all of us, whether it's the indus uh, tech industry or tourism or whatever, it impacts all of us. Well, I would say uh, continue reading Mountain Journal and, and, and reading Montana Free Press uh, for the coverage um, up in Helena as, as we get near there. Uh, any, any fun? Oh, you got the mic there yourself. Hi. Look, you stole it. No, I just, I just passed kidding. it on. Just kidding. Um, the joke is that the people who moved here because of a river runs through it are no mad at the people moving here because of Yellowstone. So I had not heard that before. Yeah. Um, and just as a thing, I think that the, the housing problem we're having right now is, is kind of a transitional thing. It's going to solve itself probably quicker than we think. I just posted a report, and it, it asked um, through a whole series of events, how many people who've moved here in the last several years uh, plan on staying in Montana or who are now actively looking at other places? What do you think the percentage of people is who are going to stay? We know this. Well, yeah, kind sort of. of. It, kind of. I, 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 I saw an article pop up. It's like 87% of the people that move here leave. 13% are going to stay currently. That's, a, that's an amazing number. They call it the sticky number. Yeah. Alaska is at 10. So, um, yeah. But uh, the other question, they a lot of the state. They a move lot here of the and then they're like, nope, leaving. <laughs> <laughs> it's too cold. It's too windy. I'm sorry. What was your a lot of the a, a lot of the communities that you're talking about and you represent have shoulder seasons. I mean, have have humps where they have a lot of activity, and one of the goals, or they're dying like Shoto, um, or not getting that that thing. How many are working on trying to help those communities get sustainable businesses? Get get businesses, not tourist based businesses, but tourist uh, real businesses by by trying to engage those who lived there before, um, the native 
sons and daughters. And I, I'll point to one example. Winifred, Montana, has done an outstanding job of working with a couple of the alums who, you know, live there or were born there. Uh, Winifred just got a $40 million high school. Guess the population of Winifred. It's just a couple hundred, isn't it? 172. So you can do things to improve small communities by being creative, trying to bring businesses in. Many of those tourists, if you had a active program to say, hey, think about starting your business here. You know, it's something that has, is being done. Um, and I hope Montana can try and start taking a look at how to help those small communities uh, build more sustainable uh, economies. One thing, I just want to add to that, um, but I think one thing that's so important about what you're talking about is that then you have people who are actually like integrated into the community and they're not people who are living there, but they're, you know, working remotely for something in another state or country and so they have no real stake, right? I mean, because there's a lot of that where I live also, which is people who moved during the pandemic, their jobs are remote, they don't necessarily have kids in the school, like they are, they don't really have a reason to get involved or engage with the local community. Um, and so I think that's a great point. They're transitory. You know. Well, but they like they live there, but their heart, their soul isn't there. Until the they decide not of, to. They're not connected to the place. I, I do want to add something that came out in all of almost all of our community meetings, because these are small towns. Um, I mean, the larger towns in our region um, have their own organizations like us, so um, we support them how we can, but we really focus on our, our rural towns. And one of the things that kept coming up was volunteer, the volunteer base, those movers and shakers that have the energy and the drive and the time to lead those initiatives forward. And they said, it's really hard because they used to have a big pool of volunteers and that pool just has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. And they're trying to figure out how do we, how do we build that pool back up and how do we get people excited about moving the community forward. But yeah, that was, that was, a, that was an also an enlightening thing to learn in our, in our small towns. Because you need someone to lead that charge. And I agree 100%. Um, and I also, um, I, there are a lot of really special places in Montana. And I think that I was at one, it was a sustainable destination meeting and uh, the chamber from Big Timber came over and a, there was a lot of conversation about too many people. And she was saying, we'll take some of your people. <laughs> so, you know, how do we encourage people to get off the beaten path as well? And, um, and that can alleviate alleviate some of the pressure on the really high trafficked areas. Um, I, I do want to add one thing too is um, uh, we as a in the DMOs have been talking with the state and there's an inequality across the state in terms of the number of visitors that are going across the state and in the last session we got a Senate Bill 540 passed which the main focus is that, of that was to put more emphasis on rural tourism, rural communities, um, on undervisited and, um, yeah, undervisited and rural areas. That's Eastern Montana. And so almost the entire campaign for the State uh, Department of Commerce, their tourism, is Eastern Montana because they're in that line. You know, Eastern Montana's like, we'll, we'll take them. We, we, we need them. And so there has been a, a shift to try to level this out a little bit. And I will tell you, um, again, Data Geek, the leveling off in Montana has, is occurring. We, we, everything is, is flat now in terms of visitors and spending and, and such. So we, we, we look at that on a, on a regular basis. But Eastern Montana needed some loving, and they're finally getting it. Oh, one more. Yeah. Question. Um, we've been talking mostly in the context of tourism and recreation, but there are also maybe they fall more in that 13% uh, people moving to communities thinking about climate change um, and moving away from areas without access to clean water or in danger of smoke. Um, so how moving this conversation slightly from recreation tourism um, to sort of more 
displaced peoples or peoples moving to this area, what do those conversations look like right now? Well, I would say that I can identify some people in our community that, that self-identified as climate refugees from other places. Um, they're very wealthy people that are choosing to come to Montana because from Florida, you know, so I, um, yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I'll chime in on that a little bit. I, I did uh, a series on wildfire based on, and how it's affecting folks in wildland urban interfaces based on uh, how they're, migrating and moving around the country. A lot of folks have been, are coming to the Mountain West, are coming to Montana um, from places like Florida, from places like California that are seeing disaster after disaster and all kinds of different levels. Um, I mean, I believe that California and Washington are the largest numbers of folks coming into Montana, but uh, it's, it's, fascinating when you start looking into some of these headwaters economics has done a bunch of studies on it. I would suggest taking a look at what what they've done um, based in Bozeman but but you know that's having that's having massive effects I think climate change is going to be is 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 the problem facing um, the, the the thing that we're going to need to be addressing uh, on a major level because of everything from you know what it's doing to you know the entire world, but also the way it's shifting people around uh, is is fascinating. Um, but you know it can also lead to folks leaving places like Florida, where they're escaping hurricanes, and moving into places like Montana into the wildland urban interface, where they're now facing wildfires and didn't even realize it. So, and oh yes, yeah, right, yes, of course that. Um, but yeah, so anyway, I think that's a great question. I don't know if anyone else has any further answers on that, but I do think you know climate change is a, going to be a major, continues to be a major factor. I ran into somebody in downtown Livingston who had just recently moved, and they were asking me about pollu the pollution coming from, they were really confused because it was coming from Yellowstone. It was wildfire smoke. Like they like thought that they were gonna live, like they had a very different idea idea of what it meant to live here, then, um, yeah, they're, they're not ready for the new challenges. The smog in Yellowstone needs to be addressed. <laughs> um, yeah, there you go. Uh, well, look, I think, I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, but really, thank, thank you all for coming. Uh, you know, on behalf of, of Mountain Journal uh, and Montana Free Press, um, Thanks everybody for, for coming and listening and participating and thinking about uh, you know, these very important conversations we need to continue having. Um, please give a, a round of applause for our panelists, Racine, Hillary, Michelle. Thank you all very much. Um, you know, when, when kind of in closing here, you know, when, when we started this discussion, you know, we talked about shared values um, you know, in a country at a time uh, right now, um, facing a critical election, uh, we find ourselves divided, arguing, you know, with each other about things we value uh, as families, you know, within our belief systems. Um, but I would just say, you know, as we go forward, let's consider, you know, these differences and remember that uh, many of our values are shared. Um, that Montana in the West is a truly special place uh, that needs us to value it as much as we need to value each other. So thank you all again very much for coming out and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the events here. Thank you everyone. Thank you.